survival is the name of the game. Survive. One can get tired of turning the other cheek. Fanny Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was one of the most influential leaders of the civil rights movement, regardless of color or background. The civil rights struggle changed the lives of thousands of people. They risked all they had, jobs, possessions, and their lives. Congressman John Lewis was one of the leaders of the movement. Fannie Lou Hamer was beaten, she was jailed, she was harassed, but she never gave up. She never gave in, and she didn't give up. She stood up to governors, stood up to police officials. She even stood up to President Lyndon Johnson when she testified before the Democratic Convention in 1964. Hamer was born October 17, 1917, in Montgomery County, Mississippi, one of the poorest areas of the nation for blacks. Like most Delta blacks, Hamer and other family members were sharecroppers. The sharecropping system was devised to replace slavery as a source of cheap labor. Sharecropping was a system under which poor tenant farmers were each assigned a piece of plantation land to farm. Her family was paid $50 by plantation owners every time they produced a future field hand. The tenant was given a house, food, seed, fertilizer, and farm equipment on credit from the plantation owner's company store. At harvest time, the landowner was due half the crops and the sharecropper the other half. The sharecropper had to pay for his supplies out of his earnings. But most times, the amount owed by the sharecropper was more than his crops were worth, according to the plantation owner. This kept sharecroppers in continuous debt to the landowner and this meant poverty. Sharecroppers who tried to escape from this slavery by moving to another farm had their personal property confiscated as payment for debt or were killed. Through the hard work of both of her parents and the 20 children, the Hamers grinded their way out of the cycle. Her father was able to rent land and purchase his own animals and equipment. Their new prosperity ended abruptly. A white man poisoned the feed and killed their stock. The family had to return back to sharecropping. Fannie Lou Hamer's introduction into the political process began in August of 1962. Motivated by one of her friends, Hamer attended a rally held by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee for Voter Registration. At 45 years old, Hamer made the decision to stand up against political racism. If there is anything that people and especially young people can learn from this brave and courageous soul. It should be to be consistent, to be persistent, and to keep in mind that the struggle that we are involved in is not one that lasts for one day, or one week, or one month, or one year, but it is a struggle of a lifetime. On the day of registration, Hamer was met by the Mississippi Literacy Test. Blacks had to copy and interpret a section of the Mississippi State Constitution to the satisfaction of the county examiner. Hamer failed the first time. On one of her frequent trips back to attempt to register, Hamer told the clerk he would see her every 30 days for the rest of her life until she passed the voting test. In January of 1963, Hamer passed the test 
and won the right to vote. Following her victory, hundreds of other blacks won the right to vote. Due to her determination to vote, Hamer, her husband, and daughters were evicted from their plantation home. The landowner kept their property, claiming they owed him money. That night, a white hate group came to the home and shot it up. They did the same thing to the home of another person active in registering black voters. In a separate incident, two female students from Jackson State University were wounded. This kind of harassment was common for blacks or anyone else who worked to improve the horrible living conditions in the Mississippi Delta. Many times, Hamer almost lost her life. She knew she could be killed at any moment. One of the methods she used to cope with the constant danger was by singing spirituals at meetings and during marches. Her comrades were re-energized by her gift and welcomed her songs. I'm never sure anymore when I leave home whether I'll get back or not. Sometimes it seems like to tell the truth today is to run the risk of being killed. But if I fall, I'll fall five feet four inches forward in the fight for freedom. I'm not backing off that and no one will have to cover the ground I walk as far as freedom is concerned. Fanny Lou Hamer. Hundreds died pursuing equality. Samuel Young Jr. was a student civil rights worker shot and killed in a dispute over a whites only restroom in 1966. This is an era of social revolution. In such revolutions, individuals sacrifice their lives. Samuel Young Sr. Hamer also spoke out about another issue. One of the greatest obstacles to black progress at this time is disunity among blacks themselves. At certain intervals, blacks are kicking blacks in the back. While the white man is killing us, some of the same things are happening in the taverns and nightclubs among ourselves. Fanny Lou Hamer. Her strong interest in the fight for civil rights motivated her to apply for a job as a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. After she was hired, one of her major responsibilities in the new position was to travel to the cotton fields and encourage black workers to register to vote. One day, I think historians would pick up their pens and they would have to write that this woman this one brave soul who had been a timekeeper on a plantation in the Delta, Mississippi, that with her word, her ability to speak, her ability to sing, her ability to organize and tell people to stand up, that she moved not only the state of Mississippi, but she moved an entire nation that she led us in the fight for the right to vote. Eventually, her work took her outside of Mississippi. Less than nine months after Hamer was hired, she and other members of the Southern Christian Leadership Council and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee were returning by bus from a voter education workshop in Charleston, South Carolina. They were arrested for entering the white side of the terminal and held in jail. White supervisors told a group of black police officers to beat them. At first, the black officers refused, but when they were told they would be fired, they reluctantly did it. Hamer suffered kidney damage and permanently injured her left eye from a blood clot. 
From her jail cell, Hamer heard white officers plan to murder them. The plan was to let them out of jail and then kill them for trying to escape. They offered to let us go one night, but I knew it was just so they could kill us and say we was trying to escape. I told them they'd have to kill me in my cell. Fannie Lou Hamer. I had two encounters with Fannie Lou Hamer. One was on the telephone and one was in person. At the time, I was an employee of the Voter Education Project, which was directed by the late Wiley A. E. Branton. Ms. Hamer and Annel Ponder, a young civil rights worker, had been taken off of a bus and put in a jail in Mississippi and beaten. And Mr. Branton had been uh, instrumental in getting them released from jail. No doubt he was instrumental in saving their lives, actually. But as soon as they had been released from the jail, Mrs. Hamer called the Voter Education Project in Atlanta. We were at 5 Forsyth Street at the time. And she was still emotionally overwrought from her experience. And she gave us the account of exactly what had happened to her in that jail. And I'm sure that story has been told many times, how two black men had been forced to take sticks and beat her and Annelle. And actually, it injured her badly because she was a polio victim as a child. And she walked with a limp, and they had beaten her all over her legs. And I remember the most heartrending thing that she said to me over the phone was, they beat me, and they beat me till they couldn't beat me no more. And it hurt her so badly that these two black men had had to perform this. But Fannie Lou Hamer was a person who was not afraid to die even though she underwent some horrendous experiences. Even though Hamer knew many whites hated black people, she refused to hate them. It wouldn't solve any problem for me to hate whites just because they hate me. Oh, there is so much hate. Only God has kept the Negro sane. Fannie Lou Hamer. After movement representatives were notified about what had happened, they contacted the Justice Department. Inquiries by the Justice Department into the circumstances surrounding the arrest led to them being freed after three days in jail. After the passage of the 1964 Public Accommodations Law, making it illegal to discriminate against blacks in public places, the momentum grew stronger for the right to vote in Mississippi. Hamer and other leaders in the movement knew that many of the states, towns, and counties had mostly black populations. Winning the right to vote meant electing many black officials who could help the race improve their standard of living. The push for voting rights in Mississippi also drew the attention of thousands of white student volunteers throughout the nation, and they came to help black people in their efforts to register. In August of 1964, two white volunteers from the North and a young black from Mississippi were murdered in Neshoba County, Mississippi. In the spring of 1964, Hamer and other people in Mississippi formed the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party after they were barred from Democratic precinct meetings. After Hamer attended a meeting, her husband was fired from his job the next day. Hamer was elected vice chair of the party and was fearless in speaking publicly about black and white relations. In my opinion, race relations have not improved some people, it seems, will never change. One of the best examples of that is the recent killing of Miss Jo Ethel Collier by three white men following her graduation exercise in Drew, Mississippi. Drew has a long history of mobbing and killing, and the same thing is still happening today. At one time in Mississippi, whites used to kill without bothering to explain. 
But at this point, in such cases, explanations are given. Fanny Lou Hamer. In 1964, the MFDP, made up of black and white delegates, went to Atlantic City to attend the Democratic National Convention. They presented their evidence that the white delegation had been selected in a fraudulent method. Hamer's group asked the Convention Credentials Committee to refuse to seat the Democratic delegates and instead recognize the MFDP as representatives from Mississippi. President Lyndon Johnson was unopposed for the Democratic nomination and held a commanding lead over Republican challenger Barry Goldwater. Johnson made careful plans to use this opportunity for national television coverage to enhance his image in the Democratic Party. The MFDP could ruin this. The group was led by famous civil rights attorney Joseph Rao. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the people who testified before the convention's credentials committee, but it was Hamer who shook the conscience of the nation with her moving testimony about the terrible economic conditions blacks were pinned under. Her shocking comments of how she and others were badly beaten for attempting to exercise their legal rights to vote drew national attention. It is the very terror that these people are living through that is the reason that Negroes aren't voting, that they're kept out of the Democratic Party by the terror of the regular party. And what I want the Credentials Committee to hear is the terror which the regular party uses on the people of Mississippi, which is what Reverend King was explaining, which is what Aaron Henry was explaining, and which is what the next witness will explain, Mrs. Fanny Lou Hamer. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, my name is Mrs. Fanny Lou Hamer. And I live at 626 East Lafayette Street, Ruseville, Mississippi, Sunflower County, the home of Senator James O. Eastland and Senator Stennis. If the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep? with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. We will return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC's Robert. When the MFDP appeal was rejected, Hamer and other members vowed to keep fighting. During this period, Hamer's political experience grew. She became acutely aware that the human crisis faced by blacks in her state was also a plague throughout the nation. Johnson won the Democratic nomination as the Vietnam War grew. After the Atlantic City Convention, Hamer and the MFDP developed strategies to take their case to the United States Congress. Since blacks in Mississippi were prevented from nominating and voting for their own candidates, the MFDP conducted its own election. Their ballot listed the white incumbent and the MFDP opponent. Hamer was on the ballot representing the second district. She received 33,000 votes against 49 for the incumbent. In September of 1965, 15,000 pages of evidence were presented to the Congressional Subcommittees on Elections when they heard their case. It proved that 40% of Mississippi's people were being denied voting rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Racial progress 
almost a hundred years ago during Reconstruction, John Lynch placed this same kind of challenge before the House of Representatives. He was a black man from Mississippi, and he succeeded with Yankee white help. But we failed a hundred years later with native white Mississippi help and Yankee opposition. So you see, this is not Mississippi's problem. It is America's problem. Fannie Lou Hamer. It's rare. It's rare these days to see people with that kind of courage. Um, I think she, I, I really don't know where she get this courage that she had, but it was, it was uh, obvious that it was, and everybody um, sort of saw it in her. Uh, when she would speak and talk, it would rage, you know, that uh, she knew what she was talking about. Uh, she was dead right in what she was saying. Uh, some may not necessarily agree, but I think they had to respect it because she was uh, speaking from the heart. Um, and um, uh, she did it in such a uh, dramatic way, I should say, that was unique, although simple. Although they met defeat for the second time, the MFDP's pressure was a major factor in forcing Congress to pass the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Three years later, at the Chicago Democratic Convention, Hamer and the biracial delegation, now named the Mississippi Loyalist Democrats, stood up one more time and challenged political exclusion. This time, they succeeded in replacing the old establishment. Hamer was elected committee woman for the Mississippi Democratic National Committee and served three years. The lot of blacks in the South has not improved very much in any particular area. The areas which I consider most important for changes to be made are in the areas of political and economic power. Black people must register and vote. Fannie Lou Hamer. As Hamer's political participation increased, she became more knowledgeable of the depth of America's racial problems. By 1968, she saw that this was not a battle solely for black rights, but a war for human rights. This same year, Hamer worked closely with Dr. King to help him organize the Poor People's Campaign. His strategy was to build a multiracial coalition of poor people to demand economic parity. We have to realize just how grave the problem is in the United States today. And I think the sixth chapter of Ephesians, the 11th and 12th verses, helps us to know what it is we're up against. It says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, this is what I think about when I think of my own work in the fight for freedom. Fannie Lou Hamer. After Dr. King's assassination in April of 1968, the civil rights movement's momentum slowed. Hamer, like many of the other influential people who had risen to be national figures, returned home. In Mississippi, Hamer continued to aid poor blacks living in Ruleville and Sunflower County. She also led the fight that brought the Head Start program for low-income children to her state. Her national reputation in civil rights presented her the opportunity to travel to Africa and Europe. Despite her influence, she remained humble. Hamer also delivered jobs by bringing a garment factory to Ruleville. And 
she was instrumental in opening a low-cost daycare center named after her. When plantation workers found themselves without jobs after farms started using machines, Hamer formed the Freedom Farm Cooperative that grew to 680 acres. Hamer's early years were hard. She and her brothers and sisters spent long hours picking cotton on white plantation owners' farms for very little money. Along with being poor as a child, she also contracted polio. These factors took a heavy toll on her as she got older. During the Civil Rights Movement, she often went without adequate rest. After the movement ended, she was struggling financially. Friends and some people in the movement raised money to build her and her family a house. The severe gel beating she suffered had left permanent injuries. Her troubled medical history, battling diabetes and heart trouble, was compounded in the mid-1970s when she developed breast cancer. She had a mastectomy in 1976 and went back to her duties. The cancer spread. On March 14, 1977, Hamer died in the Mound Bayou Community Hospital. Hamer's gravestone is marked with her motto, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Although she dedicated her life to improving the financial conditions of poor people, she remained poor during her lifetime. Fannie Lou Hamer was one of the most important figures during the 20th century. Her courage demonstrated the fact that our nation has improvements to make in human relations. If not for her efforts, our many liberties would still be denied. Fannie Lou Hamer must not be forgotten. Let us not lose her legacy. She could not tolerate the wrong that was done to blacks and disenfranchised people in Mississippi and throughout the South. She fought hard, and I think she was able to do that because she was a strongly religious person. She was a beautiful person inside and out. And even though when she went to the Democratic National Convention and stated we are sick and tired of being sick and tired, she captured the attention of even those who did not agree with her. She will be long remembered as a strong civil rights activist and a beautiful woman who was willing to lay down her life for what she believed in. And we should all thank her for that and never forget her. She was, would get quite emotional about it and she knew that anything could happen to her at any time. But I think her sense of purpose and her faith in God is what saw her through those times. She wasn't going to let anything turn her around. She had something that so very few people had. And I think that she had been ordained and touched by a higher power to be able to, to lead people like that and to inspire them. Because certainly everybody was afraid and she would have been less than human if she had not been afraid. But she had faith in a higher power. Thank you.